everyone. Welcome to this Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce Roundtable discussion. I'm Kevin Havelock. I'm Head of Corporate and Commercial Banking for Edinburgh and East of Scotland at the Royal Bank of Scotland. I'm also a Governing Council member of Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce uh, and delighted to host today's session all about robotics, specifically the National Robotarium and the future of robotics. I never ever thought I'd be presenting a session about robotics and I, and I am absolutely all ears and fascinated uh, about what we're going to hear today. So throughout the pandemic, last 15 months or so, the Chamber has continued to run events, but rather than meet physically in the city, uh, we have, uh, we've done a brilliant job, if I may say so myself, uh, the team have done in terms of taking all these events online. And while maybe we don't like Zoom as much as all meeting somewhere in the city, it's been a great way for us to continue engaging with members in what has been a very difficult time for many businesses and organisations and many of our online events have been very well attended. But we're looking to the future now and today's uh, session is all about looking to the future. The format today is relatively straightforward. In a few moments, I will hand over to Professor Helen Hasty, who will make a short presentation about the National Robotarium that is under development at Heriot Watt University and due to open next year. Following Helen's presentation, we will open up for questions, observation and discussion. As we're all in the Zoom room, um, if we could please at that point use the raise hand function, um, turn your camera on, etc. when we get to that point uh, and, and I will bring you into the conversation at that point. So Helen Hasty is Professor of Computing Science at Heriot Watt University, Director of EPSRC Centre for Doctoral Training in Robotic and Autonomous Systems at the Edinburgh Centre of Robotics and Academic Lead for the National Robotarium, as I said, opening in 2022 in Edinburgh. Helen has over 100 publications and has held positions on many scientific committees and advisory boards, including recently for the Scottish Government AI strategy. Helen, you're very welcome, over to you. Hi, thanks Helen, thanks for having me this morning. And um, so it's my pleasure to talk to you about the National Robotarium. So as Kevin said, it's um, a building um, that's going up. We had a city deal of funding for building um, ladies cutting edge research facility out on the outskirts of Edinburgh and the Heriot Watt University campus. So today I'll talk a little bit about robotics, why it's important, and um, I'll talk about the history of the Edinburgh Centre of Robotics, um, and a bit about skills, and also about the building and kind of the exciting activities that we're going to be doing there, and mostly about kind of how we're going to be working with in industry through the Robotarium Initiative. So why robotics? Why are robotics important? So they can be used for a number of industries. You may be kind of thinking about robots as those kind of repetitive tar repetitive robots that work in factories. We call them lights out factory because they can work 24 seven and they don't typically make mistakes and they kind of do kind of pretty much dumb but repetitive accurate tasks. Um, but what we really want to do in order to really achieve the potential of robotics is take them out of these controlled environments and put them into dynamic, um, dynamic scenarios. And to do that, they need intelligence. So we're talking about intelligent robotics. So we've been doing some work on robots for hazardous dynamic environments. So we've been working with energy companies um, on a project called the EPSRC Orca Hub. Um, so the idea behind this is that you can get robots to go out and do inspection and maintenance. And again, they can do this kind of 24 seven. So we have preventative maintenance rather than more costly um, re reactive kind of maintenance that we do at the moment. Um, but it's difficult, right? Because these are, for example, offshore, there's wind and <laughs> rain and, and uh, robotics is hard. Um, so this is really, really challenging, but there are definitely ways that robots um, and autonomous systems, so we're talking about drones, um, as well as ground robots, underwater robots. So we have a lot of work on, in the maritime domain. So we have autonomous underwater robots that go deeper than humans can even really go. Um, doing inspections of underwater pipelines, for example, um, autonomous shipping is, is another area that we're getting into. The nuclear as well, these are all places that humans just really shouldn't go. So we're keeping humans safe, keeping them in the loop, but they're away from the hazardous, uh, hazardous environment. 
We're also interested in agri-robotics. We think this is going to be important going forward. So in the Robotarium, we've allocated a field behind it. I don't know if you've been to Herrick Watt, but it's got lots of lovely um, open green areas. And so we've allocated a field for our agri-robotics uh, development. So that's really exciting. And these are challenges such as fruit picking, right? Because the robots typically you think they're hard grippers. So how are we going to be able to pick fruit? And so the idea of soft robotics is, is um, another area that we, that we research into. Um, okay, so then what about robots and humans? So this is really my area of uh, expertise is how we can interact with humans in a way that they can understand. So natural language is one way to do that. Um, and applications um, for kind of close proximity robotics or healthcare, assistive living, uh, surgery and robots has been shown, social robotics has been shown to, for example, combat loneliness, help with dementia. Um, so these are all areas as well that we're looking at, as well as re rehabilitation. We have some experts in that as well. And then finally, you can delivery robots in the pandemic. This is something that people have really kind of start to understand. Um, and we're seeing some companies emerging that are just doing kind of delivery robot robotics. Um, but the future is this idea of last mile. So the robot comes, uh, delivers to your house and actually picks up the groceries, walks in the house, puts them in the kitchen, maybe even puts them away for you. Um, so that's kind of something to think about and think about in the future. So I hope that gives you a bit of a snapshot. There's lots of other applications of robotics. But those are kind of some ideas um, to give you kind of a bit of a setting. So the Edinburgh Centre of Robotics is an initiative between Heritage Watt University and the University of Edinburgh, and it's been going on since 2014. And since then, we've had about £120 million of research um, between the, the universities, and that comes from government, but also from industry projects as well. Um, so as part of that, we have already state-of-the-art equipment. Um, part of the Robotarium is the Bay Centre at Edinburgh University and they already have um, the Valkyrie robot and we're the only ones in Europe to have one of these space NASA Valkyrie robots. Um, but also at Herrick Watt we have um, latest cutting edge robots, so for example the iCub um, and also the underwater mm -hmm. surgical um, robots as well. So we have the research, we have over 65 experts in a wide range of um, disciplines and more broadly the theme of the centre is around safe interaction. So as these robots are kind of coming out of the factories and going into our workplaces, into our homes potentially, then they really need to be able to interact safely. So this can involve physical interactions with the environment, which might change. So you may move the chair from day to day. So we need to know that the chair has been moved, for example. Um, interaction with people, that's very important, as I touched on. Self-interaction, kind of condition monitoring, the basic one of those is, oh, I need to recharge. But other ones are things like, oh, you know, I think something might be wrong. Or, and also explaining kind of reasoning um, behind that decisions. And if something is going wrong, why they think that might be. And then we do core, what we call interaction enablers. So we do core artificial intelligence, um, natural language processing, vision, um, these types of disciplines as well. So a large group of experts in a wide variety of uh, fields all coming together and working in these multidisciplinary projects. It's a very, very exciting place to be at the moment, Edinburgh for Robotics. We also do um, skills training. So I'm going to talk a little bit just briefly about the centre. So I'm director of the CDT, so it's a centre for doctoral training. So this is a large chunk of funding that we get um, from the government to uh, graduate over 150 PhD students. So they have critical mass of these PhD students and they're all being trained on the latest uh, robotics autonomous systems research. Um, but they're also being taught on innovation, entrepreneur skills, kind of the softer skills as well. So we're hoping that these are going to be the next generation of roboticists to go out and go out and create the latest, latest greatest uh, robotics. And we have, you know, if they don't even want, if they don't want to go into their own business, you know, they have graduate destinations such as Dyson, DeepMind, as well as more local companies in Edinburgh, such as Seabite, 5AI, um, and also some, some go into academia. So we have this pipeline, um, we've got the experts, we've got the skills, we've got the equipment, and really the next thing we need is the building. So this is um, a graphic of what the building's going to look like. Very kind of sci-fi. It's got a smart, uh, uh, a smart wall on the outside that we can change. Um, environmentally friendly. 
Um, but it's, as I said before, it's more than um, just the building. The building's very exciting. You tell I'm excited about the building. But it's more than the building. So it's really going to be a center for um, innovation. So what we're hoping to do is to work really closely with industry. And I'll show kind of the models of working with industry that we're thinking about. So we're going to work with industry. We're going to understand their problems and the challenges that they have and then co-create together solutions um, so that we can really kind of provide impact so that we can move the research in robotics kind of out of the lab and into into the marketplace into society so that we can all so that we can all um, benefit so that's a bit about the robotarium so if i've got a bit of time i'll show you the video you can see it's just what the architects have come up with this video what it's going to look like You can get a glimpse. I'm just going to turn the volume down so I can talk a little bit about it. So um, part of the Robotarium is going to be an assisted living lab. Um, so it's going to be on the right. So it's basically going to be a flat with its own front door um, and own parking space so that people can come up. Um, and we, what we want to do there is test and evaluate our robots in a situation that's familiar with familiar to the users um, so elderly people for example that we just passed out that's a robot receptionist that we're currently building looking into building um, so welcome welcome to the robotarium and we're also working on a robot um robot cafe potentially um, where you can order order your coffee via robots so these are all kind of little small projects, but we hope from hopefully they're going to have impact um, and give people an idea of how how we can use robotics. So there's going to be um, spaces for um, working with industry but also for outreach. So the key thing is that we're going to be bringing school kids in, um, general public, we have lots of activities for them so that we can really try and instill um, an understanding about robotics and how people can be involved to so try and make robotics more inclusive and more diverse because that is really an issue for the field, the field at the moment. And there's three areas of the Robotarium to align with kind of the three strands and main strands of research. So there's a human robot interaction lab, including the flat that I talked about, um, and experimental suites for human robot interaction. There's um, a suite for the autonomous systems lab, which are these big hangars where we can fly drones around and test ground robots as well for applications such as hazardous environments. And then the third component, so we're just coming up to the, so this is the autonomous systems component. Human Robot Interaction Labs. And then the third component is uh, laser manufacturing, so advanced manufacturing as well. So these are the ground robots. So large hangars. People who created this video seem to put a lot of people in there. Remember, they were hoping post COVID there'd be lots of people in the Robotarium. Um, and then we've got the laser, laser manufacturing uh, suite. Okay. So I think, I think we can move on. This is a facade picture. So we're on track, uh, we're on budget. So it's going to be open um, at the beginning of spring next year and then hopefully um, we're going to start having people in like, uh, like the public um, in the summer we'll have a big opening then as well so that's the national Robotarium. great um so a bit of background um into the funding so this was funded as part of the ddi program so data driven innovation program as i said it was a city deal funding um, and we have uh, kpis around talent so bringing talent in developing our own talent and part of that we're going to be looking at is CPD courses. So for industry, for small businesses um, to really benefit from AI and robotics, they kind of need to know what it can do for them as well as how, you know, how they can use it. 
Um, and the good news is that um, it's becoming more accessible. So there's lots of toolkits and um, kind of open source software. So you don't need to be a mathematical genius to be able to use AI. Um, and so it's kind of joining the dots and helping industry to join the dots of what robotics and AI can do for them and how, how, how we can help them to realize that. Um, so it's about talent, it's about um, data, sharing data, obviously research, entrepreneurship. So we're hoping to have um, spin outs as well from the research that comes as well as working with current industry. Um, and then really about adoption, fostering adoption, changing public perception perhaps a little bit, um, but also in terms of the different stakeholders. So any industry, any company, um, they have a variety of stakeholders and adoption needs to be broad um, from the end user all the way up the chain, you know, so people need to understand the benefits of AI and robotics. And a lot, um, we've been doing some work on kind of explainable robotics and artificial intelligence. So if you have an autonomous system, so the autonomy means that they can make their own decisions. Um, so part of the reticence is, you know, I don't really understand what, why is the robot doing that? Why is the drone changed direction? Is it gonna fail? Do I need to bring it back? Um, and part of that, which, what we're working on is um, kind of making them Trust, trustworthy, um, but also um, through explanations and kind of describing, being able to probe, why did you make that decision? And following that, you also have, have an audit trail um, as well if something does go wrong. Okay, so our core applications, as I've mentioned, so hazardous environments, energy, decommissioning, offshore inspection, that type of thing, healthcare, rehabilitation, surgery, and then manufacturing. So just to give you an example of one of the projects that um, we've had. So this is a large project that Harriet Watt has led, but with uh, four, four or five other um, universities. And this is for an um, offshore energy platform, could be um, wind farms, could be traditional oil and gas. But the idea is it's completely autonomous. There's no people on it. And everything is done by robots. So in fact, the inspection and maintenance, uh, for example. And so for that, we have a wide variety of industry partners. Um, we have lots of projects, we have industry funding, um, and then we have offshoots and, and spin outs coming out, coming out of that project. So that's one example. We have to work closely with industry um, so that we can understand kind of the, the real problems and how we can solve them. Okay, so here's a use case of um, a, this is some of my work. So what we have here is a digital twin. So you're going to be seeing a lot of these digital twins um, in the future. So this is basically a very, very realistic digital mapping of, um, this is a ga gas plant in Shetland, this is Total. Um, and what, what we can do is we can, because we're remote, because we don't have, and necessarily it's very difficult to go on site, what we can do is with these digital twins, we can run scenarios, we can train the robots to do things like obstacle avoidance. Um, and um, this is actually a chatbot that we've created so that we can kind of probe into the robot. Why are you doing that? What's going on? Um, and send them to do various missions. So this is another example where we're working closely, closely with industry. And this is um, based on work funded by the MOD a few years back. Okay, so future growth, um, we're looking at transport, self-driving cars, um, and this idea of last mile delivery. Uh, we're working with construction, so we actually, I should put this in the slides, it was only happened on Monday, but we have this dog robot called Spot, and um, it was actually going around the site of the National Robotarium being built, and it was doing a 3D mapping of that, so that, that could be lifted up and put into a 3D model for the architects and um, the construction. Um, so that was just on Monday, um, but that's just an example of how we can use ro robots for, uh, for construction. So that's an exciting area, and um, we're working with some people at Edinburgh Uni on that. Uh, consumer, retail, personal robots, we're going to carry on with that. We think that's a big area. We have done some work in education, robots for education. So there we were looking at robot tutors, so not replacing teachers, but um, having them having tutor tutoring, which is very beneficial. One to one tutoring is very beneficial, but it's not inclusive. So a lot, a lot of people can't afford that. So if you can have programs to do that and robots to do that, um, then that's um, that's something that could be very important. And then we've got the agri robotics we're going to be looking at in the future as well. Okay, I'm conscious I've been talking quite a lot. Um, I'll just mention maybe um, this program. So 
robotics is going forward, but we need to make sure they're trustworthy. And so there's a large program funded by the um, government, it's 33 million. Uh, we have one project, I'm leading one project on that. Um, so we've got 3 million for that for three years. Um, and Edinburgh University has one, um, but the whole ethos around this very large project, I think there's over 10 universities, over 100 industry partners, is about trust, trustworthy autonomy system, autonomous systems. So if we're having these systems in our home, we need to make sure that they're trustworthy. Um, so you can, uh, if you go to my website, there's a, there's a link as well there to the website. Okay, so how are we going to involve industry partners? So this is a working model. Um, I'd be quite interested to get feedback on this. Um, so the idea is that we would have these different tiers. So we'd have strategic partners who would pay a fee every year and um, they'd you know, be on the advisory board, have input um, to the strategy and they could select core projects that align with their um, needs and also influence kind of long-term uh, roadmap. And then there's the second tier, so they have some influence, can propose new avenues, um, but have a smaller, smaller fees, so smaller available, smaller projects uh, would be available to them. And then there's the affiliates, you know, can come to seminars or be able to sponsor PhDs and that type of thing. Um, so we currently work with a lot of industry partners. Um, we're hoping that this will, will increase. As you can see, there's a lot of energy, um, energy partners there um, and underwater. But we do have some some in the fintech, um, some in the construction areas as well, and, and um, other big players such as Dyson and Honda. Okay, so I think I've talked enough. That was my last slide. That wasn't too long. I'll hand over to Kevin and stop sharing. Brilliant, Helen. Thank you very much. So mind blowing, exciting, and slightly terrifying all all at mm. the same time. Um, are you able to hear me? Yeah. I'm here. Yeah, oh, you, go, you, you oh, can't, brother. Helen, but other people are nodding. <laughs> I was just saying that in, the music. in, 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 in e equal measure, you have excited and terrified me from what we've just been <laughs> through there. Terrified, eh? <laughs> but um, let, let's open up for, for questions then. Um, so looking for you to do two things if you want to ask a question. and uh, We would really like to hear from you. Um, turn your camera on and raise your hand. Um, there must be lots of things out of what Helen talked about there that you have a follow-up question for. Um, while, while you do that, though, uh, if I may ask the first question, Helen, sure. we, we, we talked there about people care social robotics. Mm -hmm. how, how accepting are people of ro robots coming into that aspect of their life, say, in healthcare and social care? And that's a very good question. I think we've got a lot of work to do in that area um, and we have to be very careful and we're very um, careful around what we develop, how we evaluate and how we um, um, evaluate, especially with vulnerable users. Um, so we're taking steps towards that, um, but I think we do, we do have to be really, really careful. So the idea of trust, people do kind of initially, they actually are quite trusting of robots um, and on uh, autonomy, but and what happens when it comes out, trust breaks down, it's quite hard to build it, build it back up. Um, but we can start small. So for example, there's a robot called Pleo, which is <laughs> a seal robot. Um, we call it robot because it can react to people um, and adapts and gets to know it's personalized. Um, and it's basically, and old people, elderly people really, feel the benefits of that, even just that kind of interaction, that touch, um, and that, if something simple like that can actually help combat loneliness. Um, and that's, you know, that's not scary at all. That's a basically a cuddly seal. Um, and I'm very, very keen on moving away from robots that look too much like humans. Um, so there's this phenomenon that we like to talk about in robots, robotics called the uncanny valley. So the more kind of human-like you get, you get to a point where robots start, especially if they're turned off, they start looking kind of like zombie, zombie-like, and that can really put people off. So I'm more of the Wally camp. So I don't know if you know Wally, um, the movie character, where you have a few simple um, manipulators that can express a lot of ex a lot of um, personality and emotions, and I think that's kind of the way we should be moving forward. So people know it's a robot and can understand its limitations. Okay, good. That's really helpful. And, and I, 
I think you're right. My own experience, even if I've just been to the airport in the days that we used to fly, there was a, a sort of image of somebody projected on body shape and, I, and I found that quite creepy, so I, I'm absolutely with you. Okay. Best, best not to look too much like a human. Um, yes. We've got a question in on the chat. Um, would you also be looking at robot-to-robot -robot interactions, i.e. a network of robots? Okay, that's really interesting. Um, so teams of robots and teams of robots and humans um, will be a really important area to move forward. Um, but some things have to happen before that. And one of them is communication. So how, how do robots communicate with each other? That's maybe not such a difficult um, thing to manage because it's all zeros and ones, but how can they communicate in a way when you put the human in that the human understands what these robots are doing and even getting humans to interact themselves with natural language so that we can have the human always in the loop understanding what is going on. I think that's important. But robot, robot interaction, I mean, you have swarms, which is um, which is an area and they collaborate, they work together. But what I'm really interested in is this idea of collaboration. So robots and humans, so multiple robots and humans collaborating together in a team. Okay, good, thank you for that. Uh, next question is, what role could robots play in our drive to net zero carbon? Oh, great question, yes. Um, so we're looking at that currently. Um, so we can drive down costs. So these large wind farms, um, you can imagine sending somebody out um, to inspect. We inspect every three, six months. By that time, you know, there's already been damage done. Um, so we're looking at drones, surface, um, robots, underwater robots to um, inspect the pipeline. So the, this is where robots are working together as a team so that people can get this whole picture of what's going on, take that data, put it in a digital twin of, for example, the wind farm, so that the offshore operator has uh, a kind of continual eyes on what's going on. And then you can really prevent, prevent damage um, and um, drive down costs, which will, of course, um, increase the likelihood that there is going to happen. What, what about in, I mean, how much electricity, obviously, big, big focus just now in that generation. But how much energy does it take to run your, there's probably no average robot, but obviously we are charging batteries and st storing electricity. What's the impact of that on the environment? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, so things you might not even think about, like training AI algorithms take up a lot of Processing power and energy, Bitcoin, for example, as well, mm. and, and concerns about that. Robots need charged. That is true. Um, but I think we need to weigh up the cost, you know, the cost benefits to the to the environment. Um, it's better to have a drone that needs plugged in versus sending a, a ship out there that you know that will need you know, need fuel to get there. Helicopters, for example, with man manned. Um, so I think you just need to think, think about the balance of that. And, you know, batteries, I'm not an expert on battery technology, but I think that's going to be getting better in the future. Yes, no, I think it's improving all the time. Absolutely. Good. Helen, just a reminder to everyone, um, you, you can either put your hand, raise your hand electronically and I will come to you. Or as we've had a couple of questions on the chat already, then, uh, then feel free to pop them on there. So further question for you then. Um, what would be the investment opportunities for private investors, such as business angels? Okay, um, well, uh, you know, robotics is getting a huge, and AI is getting a huge amount of investment um, from private investors uh, at the moment. And even robots, you know, that aren't necessarily making money yet, people can see that they have the vision that um, how these robots could be, uh, could be used um, and this is basically the future. So I think we really need investment from government as well as uh, you know private investors going forward. Um, in terms of the National Robotarium, we um, our advisory board is going to have um, some business angels on there, so they can they're going to be able to advise about how best to engage with the uh, with these kind of investors. Um, there'll be lots of technologies coming out, lots of spin outs we hope coming out as well. Um, It'll give us a bit of time because <laughs> you know but um generally we're hope we're hoping that there'll be a lot of innovation and entrepreneurial opportunities coming up and and if somebody wants to start that dialogue and relationship just now presumably they can get in touch with you direct yeah please do yes yeah, yeah. Great. okay Just talk to anybody right now we are working really hard right now behind the scenes to get everything up and running so that when we open the doors we already got 
some activity going on. Um, Okay, good. Any questions on the screen? Anybody want to wave to me? Susan, you have raised your electronic hand. Um, so feel free to come off mute and ask your question of Helen. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Kevin. And thanks, Helen, for a really interesting presentation. I've, I've got a clutch of questions here, really. Um, first on the robotarium itself. And, um, you know, it, it's described, I think, quite rightly as you know, a world leading facility in Edinburgh, both um, Edinburgh Uni and Herrick Watt, you know, have for a long mm -hmm. time rightly described themselves as world leaders in this field. But can you give us an idea of who the competition is and where the competition is? That's my first question. Um, and, um, well, do you want me to pause there and then if I'm allowed a second bite of the cherry, then I would have one. You, of course, are very welcome to have a second question. Helen, yeah. who's our competition? Okay, so we're branding this as the National Robotarium. Uh, which might have a few other robotic centres in the UK, but we're we're national. So you know, Edinburgh and Herrick Walk working together, but we're hoping to, to reach out to other centres so that we can collaborate. So in terms of academia, we really want to collaborate. We don't want to be kind of comp competitive because they have strengths in other areas that we don't. So the Bristol Robotics Lab, Oxford um, Robotics Lab, for example, and we work with them. So they're on our ORCA project. Um, we have um, CDTs that get together um, every year and have joint conferences. So we know what's going on and we, within the UK, especially for example, the UKRI Trustworthy Autonomous Systems, we've got 10, over 10 universities in the UK all coming together with, with the same kind of view of getting robotics um, and making them robust and trustworthy and, and getting them out of there. Um, industry, I mean, sometimes we can't compete with these industry, you know, big players um, in terms of size of the data. So people like Google and Amazon. Um, so I, I work on conversational AI and these, these you know, everyone's got an Amazon and they're just collecting terabytes of data and um, that we can't actually get access to. But um, these companies are now you know, making their code open source, if not their data. And we know we need to work on building relationships with the larger companies as well as the smaller companies so that, you know, that we can collaborate with them. And then Japan and the US, um, you know, Japan is one of the biggest um, makers and they have the highest adoption rates of robotics. So we can learn a lot, a lot from what's going on in Japan and we have connections there as well. Susan, your follow up question. Yeah, well, I suppose the, the direct follow up to that then is, is how Edinburgh can best benefit from having this fantastic capability mm -hmm. on our doorstep and especially in the light of events over the last um well the, through the course of the pandemic and and the whole work that's going to have to be done to recover from that how and, and i'm also thinking particularly because the robotarium was obviously a central part of the city deal you know how we can join the dots within edinburgh and the surrounding areas to really make mm -hmm. the best of the capability that exists locally and um, so that's a very good question. So the STEM activities that we're doing are working with local schools. So we already started that up and we've got some funding to buy some robots that can be in the schools. And we're gonna have pupils teaching pupils, but guided by our experts in the robotarium. So in terms of education, there's gonna be a massive benefit there. Um, we're gonna be working, as I said, with these, um, with industry. So that includes local companies. So. Uh, we have, uh, for example, Seabite. We've got a project with them where we, we they're going to come, you know, to campus and you know, we use our our robots and test their algorithms and that type of thing. So working closely with SMEs inside Edinburgh, and then you know, things like, um, you know, if we can get to trial our, our robots like in on the robotarium, but then take them out, take them to local hospitals, like delivery robots, um, local care homes. So we have connections with the charities such as CHAS, you know, and Age, Age, Age UK, Age Scotland. Um, so hopefully that um, the local society will also benefit from it as well. Good. Thank you. Thank you for the questions, um, Susan and Helen, for, for those, those answers. Um, another question coming through on the feed here then. Um, so first question is, how do you see the impact on the job market as robotics become more widely used in society? Hey, the jobs question. 
<laughs> the jobs question. Uh, that was put quite nicely, actually. I'm getting a bit more blunt jobs question. Okay. Um, so we view, I, well, personally, I view, and I think my colleagues are the same, that we view robotics as a tool for workers. So a tool to make their jobs more efficient, um, and that will save costs, you know, save money, but also um, enable people to do you know, slightly different jobs and also have more time, more free time, have higher quality of life. Um, and if you look back on history in terms of automation, um, you can see that automation has actually driven down costs so, um, so that there's actually, so the demand is higher. So for example, um, automation of weaving, a um, hundred years ago, everyone was very skeptical about that because they thought, you know, they would all lose their jobs. But in fact, it drove down the price of, of class and then that, and so there was higher demand and so more jobs were created. So the net benefit of robotics and autonomous systems, we hope will be an increase in jobs, jobs that are um, um, more, more satisfying and you know, improve quality of life. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, it, it's been an enduring issue in the Scottish economy, the, the lack of productivity growth over the last decade or so. So anything that can help us with that mm. and move us towards um, to, to greater productivity is a, is a very useful thing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things you talked about earlier uh, was about uh, robot roboticists, which is a new word on me. Um, and you talked about looking to make robotics more inclusive and 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 more diverse what what is what is the issue that you're facing there and um, so as a female roboticist um there aren't very many of us to be honest and um, so i see this with the applicants and the students in my center for doctoral training so that's at a phd level um so before i came on board we were looking at about 13 percent female so we've done i've done a lot we've been working very hard with the team to try and get that up and now we've got up to 30%, which is about, um, I think that's about 20, 25% of um, engineers that graduate are female. So we're, we are about where, you know, where we, where we should be. But what we want to do is kind of broaden robotics, um, bring in other disciplines, so psychology, cognitive science, where there are more diverse, um, where the field is more diverse and um, bring them in, kind of, train them up, get people, even from the school level, you know, try, trying to get people to understand that it's not just people and men in white coats, you know, twiddling with wires. You know, you can do projects where you're working with old people, where you're working with children, you're running experiments, doing data analysis. Um, so many different types of backgrounds can, um, can be applied to robotics. So it's about increasing diversity in the workplace. And then we're going to be better at doing robotics in a more fair and transparent way. So things like bias um, in the design of robots and bias in the data, this is a, this is a problem that we need to avoid and we need a diverse uh, workforce to, to do that. Oh, um, a follow on question, I suppose we've, we've had on, on the chat. C could you give a view of the types of jobs and employment opportunities in the future in this area, yeah. apart from AI data scientists and programmers? Okay. It seems to, to build on your, your response there. Um, we're definitely going to have to think about reskilling, re upskilling um, going forward, and we're starting to think about that as part of the Robotarium. Um, but 100 years ago, nobody really had heard of a web developer. So some of these jobs, we don't actually know what they're going to look like right now. Um, but what we have to do is really kind of be prepared. Um, the workforce needs to be prepared to be continuing you know, have this continuous learning and you know, be ready to kind of upskill and reskill uh, depending on you know dynamic changing changing our workplace environment good thank you marik you have your hand up please feel free to come off mute and ask helen your question thank you very much um a very interesting uh topic and you were talking about um getting other uh areas involved in robotics and other um, specialists. So I was wondering, how do you find partners um, and how do you come up with new applications and new ideas of how to apply robotics in other fields? And how do you find these partners and how do you work with them to actually, you know, move forward? Yes. Well, that's great, uh, great question. So the government, UK government, um, 
initiatives such as the one that I'm working on, the trustworthy autonomous systems. Um, they're very good at kind of matchmaking. So having these, we went, well, a couple of years ago, we actually went to London and they get lots of people in the room and they have sand pits as well. So, um, so people from different areas can come together, kind of brainstorm. And from that, um, just that day, I'm a cognitive scientist, a robotics engineer, psychologist. <laughs> we sat down over lunch and said, let's do this, come on, let's do this. And we got funded. Um, so that's, that's really exciting. Um, in terms of industry, um, so this is the kind, it's kind of a chicken and egg um, idea. You know, you want to bring people in, but they don't necessarily know that robotics could help them, so they might not be interested. So I think it's about communicating more broadly to industry and to, to events such as this, which is great, um, kind of what potential robotics and AI has for, the, for, their, for their business. And I, sitting here, I might not know that, um, but if we give, if we work together with them, um, then we, you know the light bulbs might start, might start to ping. You know. Thanks, Helen. It certainly is a, a role for all of us, I think, to 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 spread the message and share the word about the work that's going on. Presumably, there will be, of course, uh, quite a lot of publicity when when the centre actually opens next year. I would expect. Oh yes, yes, definitely, and we'll have. We have workshops and um, we're actually having an open day online in a couple of weeks and I can send that around as well so people can come in and, and learn, more, learn more about it. I, I was slightly alarmed in the, in the little video clip that you saw that none of those pretend people were wearing masks. This just seems completely alien to me now that people <laughs> are seeing... went a bit wild, I think they were so excited. <laughs> so so many together. people without masks. Um, quick... Uh, question on the Scottish space sector. Any opportunities there to work in that sector? Um, yep, so we have some space um, space expertise at Strathclyde, they have a large space um, programme and we have Edinburgh Uni, the, the Valkyrie there, so um, Professor Vijay Kuma is working with NASA there on a programme. Um, so there is some space, there is some space activity, but I think we're going to see more, more of it. We're, we're looking at things like little mini perseverance rovers that children can put together, <laughs> things like that. So the current Mars missions are just so, so exciting um, to watch. And I think that's going to help hugely um, in bringing, in bringing uh, more interest from all different parts of society. Yeah. But we do have expertise, it's not my area, so I don't want to say too much about it, but and there, are, there is in Scotland. And some expertise in space. Good, very exciting. Good, I think we've got time for one more question if there is either on the chat or anybody wants to, to raise their hand. So I think we are all done other than one question asking if the, the moat round about the new robotarium will have robotic crocodiles to keep <laughs> to keep people that. away. <laughs> yeah. We do have uh, bio-inspired um, robotics. Um, so the professor, for example, Barbara Webb, um, she does insect-inspired robotics and the uni. And then um, for for marine, um, they look at bio-inspired, so they look at how fish and dolphins swim and mimic that um, in their robots. So that's actually a really good idea. We should, we should put one of those in, in the merch. Put, put, put that onto the, onto the <laughs> mood board. Good. Well, thank you for that observation. <laughs> Great. Well, we don't seem to have any more questions or any other hands up. So um, really, just finally, thank you for joining what has been a great discussion today. I've, I've learned a, a huge amount, Helen. So thank you for that. Um, I'm also delighted to see collaboration across the city. And it's one of the themes that we're talking about quite a lot at the Chamber is no one person has the answer. So, you know, to have two, two of our, um, you know, uh, institutions working so closely together is excellent, but also being open about it and joining uh, sessions like this so we can all talk about it, get to learn, ask questions. And I will certainly keep an eye out for anything that I see about robotariums, ro roboticists. Um, it's, it's a fascinating area and we look forward to and best of luck when the centre opens in 2022. For everyone else, thank you very much for joining today for your engagement, your questions. Uh, that is much appreciated by me and the rest of the chamber. And please enjoy the rest of Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really nice to meet you. Bye.